here's a quick overview of the uh, files in the uh, repository for Philota 2.0. I'll just go through the different files and explain what they're for. And we'll just navigate uh, the uh, folder structure. So the folder structure is uh, generally laid out as a, a CPAN release so that um, if we're happy with the state of the source we can pretty easily turn this into a distribution which is just a sort of like a zip file that we upload to a CPAN so that then it's very easy to install on other systems uh, so that dependencies are worked out automatically and everything ends up in a standard location. So if we just go through the different folders, uh, I'll explain what the files are for. So the folder at the top, conf, is for configuration files. Right now this only contains one file, the philota.ini, which is in a standard format, which is normally used mostly by Windows. Um, here's what these files look like. So any lines that start with semicolons like these or this block and so on uh, are comments so those are uh, completely ignored and uh, anything else is key value pairs and so these are things that the distribution needs to know about itself in order to install and run correctly and there's only a couple of things really that users would need to modify uh, probably what they would need to modify is their location of blast which Philota uses for all versus all blasting of the uh, GenBank release. Uh, another thing that users may need to change is the location of any uh, dump files of uh, previous releases of Philota. So these are very very large files like this one is about seven gigs or so um, so we're not going to put that in the repository but people may want to load them into their local database um, to run analyses on them so then this would need to be changed by a user who's installing and this these two still need to be resolved so on the Philota website there's no download link to the blast to blink scripts um, so for now these paths don't lead anywhere so that needs to be corrected um, and then this would need to be configured uh, a bit differently so these two variables are for uh, directories that other nodes in a cluster would need to have access to in order to parallelize the all versus all blasting. So these would typically be directories on a shared file system that both a head node in the cluster, so sort of the leader of the computation, has access to, as well as all the slaves. So this, uh, these uh, are typically not going to be directories within this distribution, they'll be somewhere else. So configuration is going to be uh, confined really to this file as much as possible instead of having it littered over different files and hard coded in different scripts we just want to have one point where configuration takes place and that's this file. Then is the data folder. So this folder structure is now almost entirely empty. There are some readme files in there and folders. And these are going to be the places where data is going to be downloaded and stored. So there is a, a folder for blast and within that there's a folder data. And this is going to contain FASTA files that are going to be the input for all versus all blasting. There's a working directory which is where presumably temporary files um, 
are going to be stored so the output from blast and then um, there's a folder structure for genbank so this is the genbank currently release and in that there's two little files one has just the genbank release number so there's various points in the source code where we need to know what release of genbank we're working with so that's stored in this file and then there's genbank release number which is just going to contain a date stamp of the date that we downloaded the genbank release so it's not necessarily the release date it's just the download date and then there's a folder with genbank flat files so this is going to contain a whole bunch of different files that start with GB then the name of some division or group so for example for primates it will be GB PRI then a number so there's these files there's going to be a whole bunch of files for primates and they'll just have a, a serial number and then uh, the dot seek extension um, for genbank sequence files and then they're all archived so then after that they'll have a GZ extension this directory holds the NCBI taxonomy and so the way it works now the uh, taxonomy is one big file uh, or one big tar archive and out of that we extract just the notes.dmp and names.dmp files those are two tab delimited tables that contain uh, in the names table uh, scientific names and common names and identifiers for taxa in the NCBI taxonomy and the notes file holds a tree structure basically simply put it's got uh, tips so each row it has an identifier for a, a node or a tip and then its parent and so this recurses up the tree to eventually represent the whole tree structure in a tab delimited table this is an important folder this contains library files lib for library so this is a standard directory that occurs in all cpan releases and within it is a folder structure that represents a, a namespace and so with Perl we need to be somewhat careful about what these names are because uh, all the Perl code eventually ends up in one big folder structure so we don't want to clobber other names but we have a safe name to use namely we can use bio philo and I'm in charge of that namespace and underneath that I can put philota and within that is going to be the main packages that model uh, the data and the operations of the philota extended pipeline and uh, these packages are organized in three folder structures DAO for data access object contains packages that are generated directly from the database schema so this is auto generated code um, just to have a look at one of them you can see that this is based on dbix class which is a module from cpan and the package defines what table it maps onto and then this auto-generated code was clever enough to go through the schema for that table and to create accessors and mutators for all the columns in the table and some metadata about what these are for as well uh, so what data type they have for example big integers or strings or small integers or date stamps and uh, whether if they're numbers whether they're signed or not so unsigned means the number doesn't have some sort of flag to indicate it's negative or positive and is nullable 
means whether it's allowed or not to have a null value, so just nothing uh, for that record in the database. So if this is set to true, then it's okay for this to be nullable. And for example, because the GI is the identifier for the record, that GI cannot be nullable, but the other ones can. But this is all auto-generated code. Um, typically, we don't really have to look at all inside this DAO folder. We just need to know that that is how we can access the contents of the database programmatically. Then the domain folder structure has classes for the data objects the way we would like to interact with them. So this is uh, where uh, our design skills come into play. So we need to translate between sort of the requirements documents, um, such as the functions document, and between different data objects that are going to be exchanging information with one another in order to run the pipeline. So for example, we know that we're going to be dealing with very big trees and with uh, sequence data, and that this sequence data um, uh, are going to be calibrated so that we get absolute time estimates. So we need to have some sort of calibration table for that. And the calibration points are going to be derived from fossil data. Um, and we're going to want to have these sequences actually uh, be mined so that we end up with nice sets of markers and taxa. So nice phylogenetically informative alignments which we're going to be calibrating. And finally, we're going to want to build actually geophylogeny, so we need to have some geocoding data in there as well. And so this would be the class that handles that kind of data. The surface folder structure is uh, for uh, packages that operate on the domain objects. So for example, uh, we would have fossil data, but we need to get that fossil data from somewhere, and that is the task for the fossil data getter. Likewise, we're going to want to get geocoded data somewhere, probably from GBIF, and so there needs to be some sort of object that knows how to do that, so that's the locality taxonomy getter, uh, and so on. So there's sort of a separation between, on the one hand, the data objects, and the, on, on the other hand, objects that know how to get that kind of data or how to operate on that kind of data. In addition to that, there's uh, a couple of helper classes, and a very important one of these is the config object. So what this does is this object just reads in the uh, philota.ini file using a dependency called config tiny and it turns those key value pairs from the uh, configuration file into basically a hash that we can then access. So for example in the uh, ini file there's a line for that little text file that has the GenBank release number. And so we can look up what the name of that file is, like I'm doing here on line 38. And then we can read in that file and parse out the number, the GenBank release number, so 184 in this example. And we can then assign that to another hash key GenBank rel num, so the actual release number, so that uh, elsewhere in the code we can then look that up and do useful things with it. So the config object is going to be used a lot in the code, um, so you'll see this appear time and time again. Another useful class is the one that manages the database handle. 
So in the previous version of the scripts for Filota, database handles were created sort of willy-nilly in the, the different scripts. Um, but it's probably better to just have one point where that's handled and um, that will be inside this package. So here you can see the config object um, come into play. So here we use the config object to create what's called a DSN, which is a string that Perl uses to connect to databases. This is just the standard way that this is done with the uh, DBI package, which is the way Perl connects to databases. This is how you know we can connect to MySQL or Postgres or SQLite or Oracle or whatever. But in order to do that, we need to know from the configuration which database driver we're actually using. So in this case, this would probably return MySQL. We need to know the name of the database, Filota. We need to know the host. Well, that's probably local host, but it could be that we also provide access to a remote database. And the database has a user. So uh, currently that is sender M, I assume for Mike Sanderson. And the password, which is Filota. It doesn't really matter that this is public, right? There's no sort of sensitive data in there. This is just mined from GenBank. Okay, so the uh, database handle object um, can only be uh, instantiated once, or at least the second time you call new, it just returns a reference to the same thing. This is called a singleton. This so that we don't exceed the maximum allowed number of connections to the database. Now, every time we could then call a method on the database, then that method is delegated to this block. So auto load then goes back to the actual underlying database handle object, checks to see if that one is still alive. I could tell from the previous code that there were issues with the database uh, handle disconnecting um, if it's been idle for a long time. So we first check to see if it's still active, and then if it isn't, we sort of revive it, we reconnect. And then we execute whatever query or command um, the code wants to run on the database. This is also auto-generated code. It has DAO in the name, so you can tell that this is auto-generated. Um, Except um, I added some documentation to show how this is used. Um, so this part is not auto-generated, I added this. And this shows how you might actually then use this architecture to get stuff from the database. So first you instantiate a schema object, and that's a representation from the entire database, and then for example, let's say we want to get a node in the NCBI taxonomy, we create a result set for node, and then we do a lookup by an ID, and, uh, well, I, because I'm a nerd, I know that 9606 is the identifier for us, for humans, so this should return a node in the NCBI taxonomy for humans. And then from that node we traverse up the tree, so we say, okay, while that node has a true value, we assign to it its ancestor, its direct ancestor. And so this means that if we keep looping, we go from humans to the root of the NCBI taxonomy. And just to show you a little bit more of what we can then do, for example, well, we can print out the scientific name. We can fetch all the clusters associated with that node. So the clusters are the things that the Filota pipeline creates in doing the all versus all blasting. And then, for example, we can iterate over those clusters. And then we can get a result set of all the GIs, so the sequences or sequence identifiers within that cluster, and print those out. Just This is just for example. So in Perl documentation, there's often... 
this kind of section called synopsis that gives a brief usage example. So that's the library code. Then there's the scripts. So right now all this stores is just the um, scripts that existed uh, that can be downloaded from the Philota website and their configuration files. So this folder is kind of a mixed bag that needs to be cleaned up continuously. So for example, these conf files, pb.conf.browser, pb.conf.seba, pb.conf.hell, those are all superseded by the um, config.ini uh, files. So um, at some point we're just going to remove these from the repository. They're no longer relevant. This thing here is um, the old way of handling configuration files. We're also no longer going to be using this. Uh, I've re-implemented the subroutines so that we can still get the uh, GemBank release number and release date if we need to. But we're not going to go through this package. So at some point we'll delete that. Then these scripts are all scripts that are part of the uh, backend Philota pipeline. Um, and over time we will maybe divide those up in whether they are admin scripts that have to do with making backups and restoring backups and dumping the whole database and loading dumps versus scripts that are part of the analysis pipeline. Um, and in this directory, for the time being, I also put this file, which describes in uh, SQL statements how to uh, create the MySQL database. Now, we may not actually have to do it this way, because uh, when we load the database from a previous dump, the schema is recreated. Um, I just did it this way. Uh, because I wanted to get some understanding of how the schema is organized. So I uh, commented it quite prolifically. So comments in SQL start with two dashes. So all these are comments just to get kind of an understanding of how the data is all modeled. Then inside the script Philota folder, there's also a folder called var and then ww and then CGI bin, the idea being that this is the standard path, more or less, on most Linux systems for when you deploy CGI scripts. So these scripts are all things that are run on a web server in order to create the web application for Philota. Uh, I haven't done anything with these yet. Um, we might actually re-implement most of these using a different approach, which, not, which is not separate CGI scripts, but actually um, a much nicer framework that allows us to pass um, our domain objects directly into web templates. And uh, I can probably give you a brief glimpse of how that works in practice by um, tracking back into our folder structure and having a quick look at templates. So I'm going all the way back to the root now and um, I can give you an example here of how these templates work. So this is actually um, well, you don't need to worry too much about this file right now, but I just want to show you that, for example, we had the configuration object, and that configuration object knows a whole lot about um, how the system all fits together, and so we can insert that configuration object into a template, and then at any point between square brackets and percentage signs, so here's an opening square bracket percentage sign, here's a closing percentage sign square bracket, within that we can then ask the configuration object for the value of some key in the INI file. So here's an example. Here we connect to MySQL, 
and we need to then know the username and so the configuration object knows the username so we can just ask the configuration object also it knows the password so that happens here and it knows the name of the database and that happens here and so what we need to do then is pass this template through a template processor that then puts the actual values that are returned by the configuration object into the template and in this case we do that on what's called a make file but we can equally do that on HTML files the end result being a website now here are some more standard files um, one of them is this file called manifest.skip what this does is if we prepare a cpan release then there are some files that we don't want to end up in the distribution which people are going to download from cpan uh, you might recognize for example this so on a mac these hidden files are added all over the place we don't want to voice those onto windows users so in this manifest.skip file we can give a pattern for file names to skip over um, another one to ignore is for example this komodo project file um, and any other sort of temporary files or archives that we don't want to redistribute and so on so this manifest.skip is for uh, cpan releases this file is kind of the same idea except this is for files that we don't want to end up on the git repository right so this also has patterns in it which are uh, patterns for files that we might have locally on our own hard drive within the Philota folder structure but we don't want git to track those and among these would be for example any big archives or dump files that we download from elsewhere makefile.pl is a standard script that occurs in nearly all cpan releases it is a script that more often than not is built around this module xutils make maker which is a standard module that every Perl install has and that module exports one function write make file and what that does is that when we execute the makefile.pl so we just type Perl makefile.pl on the command line it'll check to see if all these prerequisites are available and it'll give some feedback on how that's going and then it writes what's called a make file so without the .pl extension and that make file is a file that is executed by a program called make and uh, it is used for building things so make files are also distributed for example with software written in C or C++ uh, or other languages and it contains sort of a pipeline for compiling and installing software and we're going to use that to our advantage because I've learned that uh, make is actually very useful also for designing bioinformatics pipelines because there too we are transforming input and output files right uh, more often than not we're transforming between file formats or we're running some analysis that takes an input file and produces some output file and make is very handy for that and so we're going to do something slightly clever which is we're adding this subroutine here so this subroutine with this standard name my colon colon post amble is a subroutine whose return value which is returned here is a literal string that is going to be attached to the make file that this subroutine write make file produces 
And the way we're doing that uh, here is that we first create the config object here and then we run that config object on this makefile template which I showed you earlier the one with the square brackets and presented signs and so then here is the point where those variables that the config object knows about are going to be expanded and then inserted into the makefile so that's handy because then when users create that makefile they can use that not just to, for example, test the CPAN distribution, install it, create a new distribution out of it, uh, but they can also do things such as, well, here they are. So, for example, here we download the GenBank taxonomy. Here, out of that, we extract the names.dump file which has the scientific and common names for all the taxa in the taxonomy. Here we extract the tree structure from the same archive. This target or this word here just allows us to type make taxonomy and it does all these preceding steps in one go. This allows us to type make schema and then it installs the schema, so the SQL file within the scripts folder, into the database. This target, DAO, so you could type make DAO, creates or regenerates the DAO code based on some database that it's going to connect to here. This target, so if you type make load dump, it'll um, load the Phylota uh, release into the database, which by the way is a very lengthy and memory intensive process. So the dump by itself is about 7 gigs and the space that MySQL needs for that is about the same, more or less, it depends. We might have to redesign a little bit, add some more foreign keys and indices which kind of uh, increases the required space a little bit more and it also takes i don't know like maybe an hour two hours it takes a good long time to load all the data at least on my laptop so then Here's um, two more files. So the readme.txt is right now completely empty. Um, but what this typically contains in CPAN releases is a general description of the project, maybe with some simple install hints. So some description that you might use the makefile.pl to create a makefile and then a description of various targets that you can run on the make file so that might be make test make install make taxonomy make load dump etc typically the readme doesn't have that much information in it because um, in many cpan releases there's going to be a bunch of other files that deal with other metadata of the project. For example, there might be a file called license that contains the software license. There might be a file called authors that lists all the contributors to the source code. There might be a file called changes that has a log of all the changes from one release to the next. Um, there might be a file called to do that has any sort of action items that still need to be done. Um, so you don't have to put that much in the README, but some basic instructions for how to get started and where to look for more information, that will be good to have in there. Then finally, this file is a, a project file for the uh, Komodo uh, 
integrated development environment. Um, I guess the convention is to not put project files under uh, a revision control system, so we might remove that down the line. But right now I find it kind of ha ha handy to have it in here. Although you can see also the reason why uh, we generally don't put it in a repository because it's probably going to contain configuration options that are specific to one developer's local machine. So for example here these are paths on my laptop but they're not paths uh, on anyone else's laptop so we probably don't want to share this with others because it's just not very handy to them. Okay, that's all we have for now.